There isn't much that hasn't been said about AMD's notorious FX processors. They've been covered time and time again, and it seems like every look back, the negative reception never gets better. The short version is, these CPUs were much maligned for being late to market, hot and power hungry, but above all else their performance was second rate compared to Intel's options at the time, and they're not winning any awards today either. The generally accepted reason for the dismal performance was a controversial clustered multi-threading approach, which involved sharing a few major resources between cores. However, there is an anomaly out there in the FX series that could change the discussion. The story's been told a thousand times already, so I'm just going to give you the history on a need-to-know basis. It all starts in late 2011 with the release of the first generation FX CPUs, known to all as Bulldozer. This series included the FX8150, 6100, and 4100. It was obvious from the get-go that AMD was shifting their focus into heavily threaded CPUs, as the lowest end config saw 4 cores with the highest end boasting 8, an unprecedented amount for a consumer CPU at the time. However, they had to make some compromises to make this possible. Cores are split up into groups of two, also known as modules, where both cores share one FPU, and this is only where the controversy starts. For the lower SKUs, AMD disabled entire modules in the chip, and for every module disabled it would lose two cores, two megabytes of L2 cache, 32 kilobytes of L1 data cache, and 64 kilobytes of L1 instruction cache. Seldom mentioned is AMD's ongoing issues with Global Foundry's 32 nanometer node at the time, which made them resort to greatly shrinking down their L1 data cache and lengthening the pipeline of their L3 to reach clock speed targets, making latencies suffer in the process. And it's not just FX that struggled on 32 nanometer. AMD's socket FM1 APUs ran at significantly lower clock speeds than their Phenom 2 predecessors, despite using mostly the same K10 architecture. Now something a lot of people seem to be confused about is if these chips actually have the advertised amount of cores, and the answer depends on what your definition of a core is. Some folks suggest the shared FPUs don't matter because there is still the correct amount of integer units present, and that if a core without an FPU isn't a core, then most 386 and some 486 CPUs wouldn't be considered cores since they lack one. Others suggest that back in those days, an FPU is optional, and current applications and games are designed around each core having an FPU since that's been the standard in the decades since. Therefore, shared FPUs don't constitute a core. It's been a pretty hot debate, and has even caused AMD to get into some legal trouble over core counts. What isn't debatable is that this approach was bad for performance, especially in code with heavy float math, which would end up stalling the chip with FPU weights and bog everything down. There were some other factors holding these CPUs back as well, but to sum it up, FX was not a great performer overall, especially in single-threaded scenarios. Consequently, reception was pretty negative, and I don't think these chips won over many people at the time. A silver lining was FX being very affordable and tunable, but many flocked over to the Intel counterparts for much stronger single-thread performance, and usually better gaming performance too. However, what if AMD FX didn't use this terrible shared FPU approach? Well, about a year ago I was doing some research on a mysterious OEM-only CPU known as the FX4200. I couldn't find much info about the CPU except some discussion about it being a quad-core FX chip, but with four modules where only the integer unit had been disabled in each module rather than the entire thing. What this means is, each core gets its own FPU and keeps the full amount of L1 and L2 cache, which has some really good implications for performance. And if you're worried that the cores couldn't take advantage of this, AMD themselves even say that if only one thread is active, it has full access to all the shared resources. Could it be that this config brings the best out of AMD FX? I didn't want to get ahead of myself though, as I still needed to get one. This was one of those CPUs that seemed to be common around China, so I ordered one off of AliExpress only for the seller to tell me they were out of stock and offered an FX4300 instead. I tried another seller and same response. So this project ended up getting shelved until late July. I saw an eBay listing in the US with actual pictures of the chip, albeit it was a little high price for me. I wasn't going to let this thing get away, so one offer and a few days of waiting later, I had my hands on this elusive CPU. It was finally time to check it out for myself and try to clear up some of the performance mysteries. Today we'll focus on four questions. First, how does the FX4200 hold up as a CPU on its own? Second, how does this 4-module four 4-core four FX compare against the usual 2-module four 4-core four parts like the FX4100 and 4350? Third, how does it fare against a Phenom 2x4? FX famously loses against Phenom 2 parts with the same number of cores, so this seems like a natural comparison. And finally, does the FX4200 redeem the famously weak quad-core FX lineup? We'll be using three points of comparison to help us gauge the FX4200's performance. Acting as our baseline is a normal bulldozer quad-core, the FX4100. 
Then we'll see how it stacks up to Piledriver with the FX4350. And finally, representing our Phenom 2 is the X4955BE. All chips will be tested at a speed of 4 GHz. Now these are conservative speeds for the FX chips, but I wanted to choose something that wasn't too difficult to attain on the Phenom 2. Ironically, these speeds required some creative tuning to get stable on the 4200, ostensibly because its stock clocks are very low, so we had to make up a lot of ground. Turbo will be disabled on all of the FX chips since it does a terrible job of sticking to a certain speed. Phenom 2 and FX are pretty different when it comes to memory needs and capabilities, so I used two different RAM configs here. On the Phenom 2 we're running our memory at 1600MHz, which is the maximum speed that can be attained without messing with the FSB. However, we're running tight flat 8 timings thanks to the 16GB kit of Crucial Ballistics tactical memory. On the other hand, FX tends to need a lot more speed in its memory, so we're using the same kit but running at 2133MHz with flat 9 timings. These are some really nice speeds and timings to use with these CPUs, and should help us to extract the best performance out of them. For graphics, I threw in the second fastest card I own, the good old RX 5700 XT Red Devil. As long as we don't go too crazy with graphical settings, it'll allow the CPUs to fully stretch their legs in these games. The board we're using is the Asus Sabertooth 990FX R2, which proved to be a stable platform with a really beefy VRM. Other parts consist of an EVGA Supernova 1600 G2 Gold Rated Power Supply, a Corsair H110i AIO, all housed inside of a coincidentally period correct Corsair carbide case. The motherboard AIO and FX4350 were graciously donated to the channel by viewer Nick, so shoutouts to him for giving us a great platform and cooling setup to experiment with these CPUs on. With hardware squared away, let's go over what we'll be testing. And I'll preface with one thing, this is not a can AMD FX game in 2025 video. If you want to see these CPUs struggle to run current titles, there's plenty of videos like that on the platform already. There will be some newer games in my roster, but I'm not going to torture these chips with a lineup of brand new titles. I want to give them all a fair shot in games that mostly make sense to run on them, so we're testing 9 games released between 2012 and 2021. We've also got a suite of synthetics to give us a different spin on their performance, along with some FPU testing. All tests were completed 3 times and averaged unless otherwise stated, and all captures were taken from the 5700XT's HDMI output with my crappy generic capture card. Without further ado, let's now dig into some testing. Starting with synthetic tests, we have Cinebench R15 running through Benchmate, and here we can see the Phenom 2x4 is leading the pack with a score of 413, now that's 14% higher than the FX4200 in 2nd place, 26% higher than the FX4350 at 327, and 32% higher than the FX4100 at 312. The Phenom is also the only one that distances itself in terms of the single thread, is scoring 105 points. The Bulldozer FXs are in the lower 90s, while the pile driver is right between the two. Next up is Geekbench 6, and this time the FX4200 is in first place with 1510 score, although the Phenom 2 is nipping on its heels. Looking at the remaining chips, the FX4200 is 12% faster than the 4350, and 35% faster than its two module counterpart. Single thread scores are similar between all chips, with the exception of the FX4100, which is falling behind by about 30 to 40 points. Note that these numbers were not averaged from three runs, mostly because they were fairly long tests. In Time Spy Extreme, the FX4200 is beating down the 4100 by about 30%, with the FX4350 falling further behind for some reason. The Phenom 2x4 had to sit this one out as it would not produce a score. Now comes the fun part, FPU intensive benches. Let's see if there really are gains to be had with the FX4200, and first off we have some of Ida64's FPU testing suite. The 4200 leads the charge, slipping past the Phenom 2 by about 10% in Julia and 7% in Mandel. However, in FP32 Ray Trace, it's a healthy 25% faster. What's really apparent though is its lead compared to its two module sibling, leading by 72% in Julia, 68% in Mandel, and 38% in FP32 Ray Trace. Next, I ran the floating point math test only in pass mark 11.1, .1, and we see a similar trend with the FX4200 leading the Phenom 2 by 16%, but trashing the FX4100 by 62%. I wish I had a couple more FPU benches to show, but at least in these two, the 4200 seems to prove its worth in the FPU department. And lastly, we're using Ida64's cache and memory benchmark, but we're ignoring the memory benches to focus on the CPU's cache here, as there's some interesting results. 
First we have read performance, and in L1 we can see the Phenom 2 trashes the 2 module FX's, but interestingly the 4200 is right up there with it. Phenom 2 falls to the bottom in L2 and L3 read, with 2 module effects not much faster, but the 4800 sees itself 100GB per second faster than the 2 module FX chips. In write, the Phenom 2 destroys all other chips by about 150 to 200 gigabytes per second in L1, but in L2 and L3, the 4200 beats it and is still almost twice as fast as 2 module FX. Copy performance shows the Phenom 2 way on top in L1 again, but it's trading blows with the 4200 in L2 and L3, with 2 module FX not that far behind. So, some key takeaways here. 1. Phenom 2 has a really fast L1 cache, and 2. The amount of modules definitely seems to have a correlation with cache bandwidth. I wish I could give a better explanation than just more modules equals more cache bandwidth, but I'll leave the super intricate details of that to more qualified people. Okay, we have 9 titles to test on 4 CPUs, so let's move along to some gaming benchmarks. First game up is Sleeping Dogs, and we're using the high preset with the built-in benchmark for testing. The Phenom 2 takes the crown with 83 FPS on average, with both the FX4350 and 4200 following closely. The FX4100 being at the bottom is a common theme in today's testing, but here it was only about 10% behind the top spot, with its 4 module counterpart leading by only 5%. Frame time performance was okay on all chips, with the large spikes only happening when the game switches scenes. Let's move on to Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor, and I tested it with the high preset and the short built in benchmark. Looking at the results, the Phenom 2 is on top once again, but the FX 4350 and 4200 have not stopped giving chase. And the 4200 was 5% faster than the 4100, so still not that much gain yet. Frame times were excellent on all setups, with basically no stutter to speak of. BeamNG's physics benchmark is a good test as it's very CPU intensive, and results directly show how many cars you can simulate. This bench takes like 40 minutes to complete, so in the interest of time, results were taken from only one run. Phenom 2 leads with almost 79 mega beams per second and 7 max vehicles. The FX4200 was only 7% behind in the mega beams department, but it could only simulate 5 vehicles, and the 4350 falls further behind in mega beams but could still do 5 vehicles. The 4100 is by far the worst with only about 62 mega beams per second and 4 vehicles. It's definitely a sweep for the Phenom 2 here, but the 4200 improved on its 2 module sibling by a decent margin. Now on to 2015's Witcher 3, and I opted not to use the next gen update as it was kind of giving our GPU a run for its money. We're using the low preset with most extra stuff like hairworks turned off, and for the bench I used a 60 second run of some horseback gameplay. Again we're seeing the Phenom 2 on top, but it extended its lead over the 4350 and 4200 to about 22%, and commands a 34% lead over the 4100. There's a little more gain with the 4200 as it's 10% faster than the 4100 this time. Our run was relatively stutter free on all the setups except for the FX4350 for some reason, which reflects in its percent low figures. We're jumping forward a few years to a Monster Hunter game that's actually decently optimized, and here I use the low preset and the Fateful Encounters cutscene for testing as it's very consistent. We see a complete turn of the tides with FX chips dominating the top positions. This game seems to like pile driver more than 4 modules as the 4350 is on top, although the 4200 only falls behind by like 2%. Phenom 2 sits in last place with the 4350 beating it down by 17%. The frame time chart looks shaky at a glance, but bear in mind it only goes up to a 50 millisecond swing, so they actually did pretty good. The 4100 is somewhat of an outlier with small stutters throughout, but gameplay felt the same as the rest, so I can't fault it. Moving on to 2019's titles, we've got Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and I stuck to the low preset and used the built-in benchmark to get my numbers. At last we see the 4200 leading the pack with 41 FPS on average, now that's 8% faster than the 4350 at 2nd place and 14% faster than the 2 module 4100. This stayed fairly consistent on all of the setups with the 4100 exhibiting little more swings than everything else. Following up is Metro Exodus. Once again we're testing with a low preset along with advanced physics turned off, tessellation on, and 16x AF. The run was taken from 60 seconds walking around the swamp as it's demanding and easily repeatable. Looking at the numbers, the 4350 and 4200 are tied for first place, although the 4200 exhibited slightly worse frame times. In terms of averages, both were 9% faster than the 4100, and 32% faster than Phenom 2. This is another game that seems to bode better for FX. 
Despite the spreads and averages, all setups maintain good frame times with only small spikes here and there. The second to last game we're testing is the Divisive Project Cars 3, and for our bench I tested a minute of a hot lap run around Havana. The 4200 is back on top with 89 FPS, slightly leading the 4350 and Phenom 2 by 3 and 6% respectively. This game definitely liked having 4 modules as the 4100 falls behind a lot further, getting beat by 17%. Frame rates stayed relatively smooth on everything with miter stutters happening throughout. And rounding off our testing is Hitman 3. Using the dark more built-in benchmark and low settings, the Phenom 2 takes the lead with 75 FPS, but the 4200 is pretty much matching it, and actually had better frame times. The 4350 is only slightly behind while the 4100 is well short of the top, once again showing good gains for the 4200. Looking at the frame times we can see all setups did well, with the middle segment seeing the most amount of variance as expected. So adding the numbers up and averaging them out, Overall, the FX4200 is the victor of this roundup with 74 FPS. However, it's not winning by much as it's only 1% faster than the Phenom 2 and 4350, which are tied for second. It's also only 9% faster than the FX4100, but considering they're the same architecture running clock for clock, it's not too shabby and shows that this quad-core config gets at least some benefit with more FPUs and cache. As we wrap things up, we can clearly see the FX4200 is not the savior that I thought it would be. Don't get me wrong, in gaming performance it's a marked improvement over 2-module bulldozer, but a 2-module pile driver more or less matches it. It also fails to beat the Phenom 2x4 by any meaningful capacity, which I think was a pretty major goal here. However, our synthetic benches tell a different story. First off, FPU performance is a great showing for this chip, being leaps and bounds above its 2-module counterparts and even superior compared to the Phenom 2. Cache performance is also very good, usually surpassing all the other chips except for the Phenom 2's L1. Now why don't we see a meaningful uplift in gaming? This is mostly just speculation on my part, but I suspect we're running into some software related issues here. Maybe Windows' scheduler doesn't know what to do with the extra resources in most games, and I doubt the games themselves are optimized for it either. You have to remember that this was a weird one-off OEM CPU, it probably never saw enough users for devs to configure it optimally. That, or perhaps more likely, the integer units are just too weak to reap the rewards of this config. In gaming, there was an obvious trend of FX leading in newer titles but faltering in older ones. Now, it's said that Bulldozer's FPUs gained no throughput over Phenom 2's, but what it did gain was better instruction support. So while FPU performance in older instruction sets was unchanged, newer ones like SSE 4 and AVX pick up the slack, which I think is what we're seeing in the game testing. Obviously, there's more to gaming performance than just the FPUs, but I'd expect it to play at least a small part. More pertinent is FX's ability to scrape by with a lot of newer games, while Phenom 2's older instructions prevent it from even launching many of them. When selecting games for testing, I ran into this issue multiple times on the Phenom 2, and I wasn't even looking at stuff from 2022 and newer. So considering all of this, let's circle back to a question from earlier in the video. Does the 4200 redeem the famously weak quad-core FX lineup? And I'd say somewhat, but it's not changing the game or anything. It's not hard to see why people were so underwhelmed by FX at the start, as the 4100 can't hold a candle to its predecessor when tested clock for clock. 4 modules successfully closes the gap, and while it may not have been everything I hoped for, it's that little bit more usable than the 4100 and especially Phenom 2 thanks to the superior instructions. However, I think this chip's strongest area remains FPU performance, and it'll be interesting to further explore it, but that's going to need a bigger lineup of tests than what I've shown here. I hope I was able to at least give you a taste of what it's capable of though. Either way, the 4200 may not vindicate quad-core FX, but it unlocks some hidden potential in this architecture and represents the best case scenario for a quad-core bulldozer.